All right, ladies and gentlemen, we want to now take you to our own producer who is there live in the courtroom. I have so many questions to ask her. Welcome, Kathy Russin. Hi, Heather. Hi, Kathy. It's so good to see you. I wanted to ask you, you know, we just heard from Patrick McStay, who has said that his ex-wife, Susan Blake, who has been testifying all day, said some things that were inconsistent, but wasn't really clear on what that was. I want to back up and go big picture. You got to see her testify and not just hear her testify. What did you think of her body language, her presentation, and how is the jury responding to her? Um, well, they're taking a lot of notes, mostly during the when she, they were listing off the checks she had written to Charles Merritt um, after the family disappeared. Uh, there's a lot of note taking. Everyone's very attentive watching her. I think she's coming across. Um, I don't think she's coming across. She's not being deceptive. Um, she couldn't remember some things, but that you know was understandable because this was in 2010. So when she was being asked dates and times, she had to have her uh, memory refreshed with her. Uh, police interview, uh, which that seems completely understandable. At the very end, she broke down and sobbed, and even when she court was adjourned, she was still sobbing in the gallery. It was very sad. So it sounds as though, Kathy, you think that his strong, her strongest testimony had to do with the checks for the defendant. Is that fair to say? I think overall for the prosecution, uh, that's one of the strongest things for them is money. It's all about money. Um, in opening statements yesterday, it's that they talked about how someone wrote a, a check out of Joseph McStay's business account, QuickBooks, to Charles Merritt, but then Charles Merritt cashed those. Some checks were written the day after the family disappeared, but then backdated to the day before, then deleted out of QuickBooks, and then um, Charles Merritt did cash those checks. So money is a common theme here. Today, uh, Susan Blake talked about how he kept asking for money, and so she started writing him checks because he would say, hey, I've got to finish this fountain work so we can keep this business going for when your son gets back. And she, she said she, at that point she would have done anything to keep the business going. And so she kept writing him checks, and she never saw any money back. Yeah, it's really interesting, Kathy, and I think that you, as always, hit the nail on the head. This case, the motive of the finances is one of arguably the strongest piece of evidence, if you, as it will, but against merit. Do you feel as though the prosecution is going to continue through the course of this case, focusing on the financial motive, and because they don't have a ton of DNA or physical evidence to rely upon? Uh, they have to, because I don't know, they don't really have a lot. Um, I have to say, for me, it's a, a little... I don't want to say concerning, but they are telling this jury the murders happened in that home in Fallbrook, right. and that four people were bludgeoned to death, yeah. hit bludgeoned with a sledgehammer in their heads, their bodies, and yet not one trace of blood anywhere. Right. No evidence of bleach smell, like nothing. I think it's I think it's a hard it's kind of hard to swallow that the crime happened there, in my opinion, um, yeah. and I don't know how they'll get around that. Yeah, Kathy, and you make a good point. I believe Susan Blake was testifying this morning about the smell, to your point, no bleach smell. In fact, there was the smell of rotting food and, you know, the different things that had sort of been left behind. And that sort of points out to your point, you know, it's not as if the place had been cleaned up and yet not one bit of physical evidence that supports that a multiple murders happened in that home. What was the jury's reaction to that part of the prosecution's opening and then the defense is opening on that particular point? Well, I, the jury's not really reacting. They're just being very attentive and listening. Um, I thought that the prosecution's opening, I thought they're, they're, they're really their strongest is the money. For the defense, I thought they gave a great opening. If you didn't know anything about this case, you know, they're pointing the finger at the other business partner, Dan Cavanaugh, and uh, I thought that they did a great job with that, and they hoped at the investigation, you have to remember, the, the McStay's home is in San Diego County, so that's where this investigation started. And it was the San Diego County Sheriff's Office that eventually assumed they had fled to Mexico, and they had treated this always as a missing persons case, not a murder case, which is why certain things weren't done. Right. And then the bodies were found in three and a half years later in San Bernardino County, which is where we are. Um, so they poke at the investigation 
constantly. As a matter of fact, during the lunch hour yesterday, the defense attorney came out and gave a press conference saying that they, this investigation was botched, that they missed the boat, that they could have collected a lot more evidence that they didn't because they kept treating it as a missing persons. Um, so I thought the defense gave a good opening. Yeah, listen, Kathy, it is wonderful to have you there behind the scenes being able to give us some feedback on these witnesses that we're not allowed to see and the press conferences that are going on at lunchtime. So I'm sure we'll be talking to you again really quickly. And in the meantime, enjoy. Thank you, Heather. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we want to take you back live to the courtroom in New Jersey in that case against Jeremiah Monell, the man who is accused of stabbing his estranged wife to death. We're going to go right back to the courtroom where the detective is on the stand.